Welcome back to the next lecture, everybody. In this one, we're going to cover the pediatric airway infections and anomalies. This is a big one, so uh, let's get started. First up, we have croup. Now, remember, croup is a viral laryngotracheitis resulting in inflammation of the larynx and subglottic airway. Now, this occurs most commonly in children who are ages six months to three years. Now, the virus most commonly associated with croup is, of course, parainfluenza virus type 1, with the majority of cases occurring in the fall or early winter months. Now, the symptoms of croup include that bark and cough, often described as being seal-like, the presence of inspiratory strider, as well as hoarseness with speaking, especially in older children. Now, fever may or may not be present in this condition. Now, the symptoms here are caused by the narrowing and obstruction of the subglottic airway, and if the obstruction is severe enough to prevent adequate airflow, patients can present with intercostal and subcostal retractions, decreased or absent breath sounds, tachycardia, cyanosis, as well as altered consciousness, which in younger children might manifest as agitation, lethargy, or even in very severe cases, a loss of consciousness. Now, we best evaluate croup on imaging with a PHS radiograph, and it's going to show subglottic narrowing, which is described as a steeple sign. Labs are not particularly useful in croup, but CBC counts are possibly going to appear low. They may appear elevated, but they could also appear normal, so it doesn't give us much. Keep in mind here that the diagnosis doesn't actually require imaging or labs. It can be made entirely based on clinical symptoms. And when it comes to treatment for croup, it depends on the severity completely. Mild cases can be given a single dose of dexamethasone or, or prednisolone uh, and then sent home with instructions to return if it doesn't get better or if it worsens. Um, supportive care can include breathing humidified air, uh, as well as ensuring that the patient is taking in adequate fluids, antipyretics as needed, etc. If the patient has a moderate case of croup, they should be treated in the um, emergency department with nebulized epinephrine, dexamethasone, plus either humidified air or humidified oxygen if they're hypoxic. If the patient improves substantially after this treatment, then we can discharge them home for uh, at-home care with a scheduled outpatient primary care appointment within 24 hours of discharge. Now, if we treat them in the ER and there's no improvement, then they're going to need to be hospitalized for further nebulized epinephrine treatments and to receive humidified oxygen, as well as IV fluids and antipyretics. Now, only one dose of dexamethasone is recommended in this condition, even if it's a really severe case. Next up, we've got bacterial tracheitis. Now, this is an exudative bacterial infection of the soft tissues of the trachea that oftentimes follows a viral infection, most often parainfluenza and influenza types A. Although it can occur in circumstances where inoculation of the trachea occurs with a fairly large amount of bacteria containing secretions, um, such as with an existing upper airway infection like strep pharyngitis or acute bacterial sinusitis, or even after a tonsillectomy. Now, most often, the pathogen causing bacterial tracheitis is Staph aureus. However, strep pneumonia and group A strep could also be seen. Now, the signs and symptoms of bacterial tracheitis include cough, strider, respiratory distress, fever, altered levels of consciousness, cyanosis, and in severe cases, marked intercostal and subcostal retractions. You may also see hoarseness in the case of a viral infection. Now, imaging should only be performed in patients who are stable enough to tolerate the delay in treatment and will usually show, show some nonspecific findings. Just as in viral croup, Bacterial tracheitis may also show a steeple sign, indicating subglottic tracheal narrowing on an AP radiograph. Lateral neck radiography can also be done and may show tracheal wall irregularity with unclear margins of the mucosa. And if this is seen, this is actually a sign of bacterial tracheitis. Labs in bacterial tracheitis aren't that helpful because they can be low, normal, or high with, with respect to white blood cell counts, and blood cultures are rarely positive. Now, in terms of diagnosis, the definitive diagnosis is made by directly visualizing uh, the problem using laryngoscopy and tracheobronchoscopy. Many cases are diagnosed presumptively based on a viral upper respiratory infection followed by clinical and radiographic signs of bacterial tracheitis. Now, a lack of response to nebulized epinephrine can also help us to distinguish between croup and bacterial tracheitis, as so many of the clinical symptoms and radiographic findings, as you know, overlap. Additionally, the fevers in bacterial tracheitis tend to be much higher as, as compared to those seen in croup. Now, treatment includes airway management with intubation and mechanical ventilation to treat current or impending respiratory failure. IV fluids and antibiotics are also given to treat the infection, 
with a regimen of vancomycin plus ceftriaxone typically being used. A trial of nebulized epinephrine is also attempted in children presenting with stridor and respiratory distress, but as I mentioned before, most will lack a response, and if they do have a response, it's usually only going to be a partial one. Now, the obstruction seen here is mostly from secretions and exudative debris rather than from edema, so the epinephrine typically doesn't have any effect, or if it does, just a very small effect. Now, if wheezing is present, albuterol may also be trialed with discontinuation if no improvement is seen. Next up, we've got epiglottitis. This is caused by inflammation of the epiglottis and surrounding supraglottic structures, typically caused by infection, although sometimes it can be caused by thermal injury from direct trauma or even caustic ingestion. Now, these non-infectious causes will come with a specific patient history, such, such as consuming very hot soup. Now, the most common cause of infectious epiglottitis is with bacteria, especially H. influenza type B. Now, since H. influenza type B vaccination is widely available in the U.S., rates of epiglottitis in children have dramatically decreased. Other bacterial infections that can cause epiglottitis could include Staph aureus, uh, Strep pneumonia, or other strep species. Rarely, viruses or fungi could be causes, um, something though to keep in mind. Patients who are under five years of age will usually present with a tripod posture, which is characterized by a hyperextended neck, the chin pushed forward, and a forward, uh, a forward truncal lean. And this position is done because it allows the patient to open up the airway to maximum patency to try and overcome the obstruction that's created by the swollen epiglottis. Now, the patient often tries to avoid lying down because it can interfere with the patency that they have uh, associated with this position. They often present extremely anxious and in severe respiratory distress with the presence of fever, strider, and a sore throat as well. Now, drooling is another sign of epiglottitis and is in fact very characteristic in epiglottitis. You typically don't see a cough in this condition, which is a common finding in croup, and that can be a real easy way for you to, help to, to rule one in and rule the other out. Airway management shouldn't be delayed for imaging, and it's important that we have the appropriate airway interventionists at the bedside ready to intervene in case there's deterioration. However, with that said, a lateral neck radiograph can be helpful to confirm the diagnosis here by visualizing the thumb sign, which represents an enlarged epiglottis. Thickened airy epiglottic folds and a loss of molecular airspace may also be seen on your lateral neck radiography. These are findings consistent with epiglottitis. Now, in terms of labs, they should always be obtained after the airway is secured. However, any intervention that can exacerbate the patient's condition, even if it's simply something that provokes anxiety, should be delayed until we've secured the airway. Once, however, that airway is secured and we can obtain more information, labs will typically show an elevated white blood cell count, and blood and epiglottic cultures can safely be obtained to identify the causative organism. Now, the definitive diagnosis is made with either direct visualization of a swollen red epiglottis on fiber optic nasolaryngoscopy or indirect laryngoscopy, or the presence of that characteristic thumb sign that we see on lateral neck radiography. Now, the treatment for epiglottitis includes promptly securing the airway with endotracheal intubation, of course, in the case of imminent respiratory failure. Now, if the airway appears sufficiently patent to begin diagnostic workup, ensure the airway team is bedside in case they're needed. Now, the patient should remain in a position that is comfortable for them, usually that tripod position, while sitting on a parent's lap as humidified oxygen is administered. Again, any intervention that is painful or that can provoke anxiety or crying should be avoided so that an uh, abrupt airway uh, obstruction doesn't develop. Now, the infection here is treated initially with vancomycin and ceftriaxone, and if the patient's intubated, blood culture and epiglottic culture should be obtained prior to giving these antibiotics. Most patients, especially those under six years of age, will require intubation, and all patients with a presumptive or confirmed diagnosis of epiglottitis should be managed in the ICU because there's a significant risk in this condition associated with, rasp with uh, rapid respiratory failure. Next up, we've got peritonsillar cellulitis and peritonsillar abscess. Now, both of these conditions involve the tissue located between the capsule of the palatine tonsil and the pharyngeal muscles, with cellulitis characterized by inflammation alone and the abscess characterized by a discrete collection of purulent material, usually located in the superior pole of the tonsil. The abscess is usually polymicrobial, with group A strep, staph aureus, and respiratory anaerobes present. Typically, the infection will worsen and progress from tonsillitis or pharyngitis to cellulitis, and finally to abscess formation. 
Peritonsillar abscesses are the most common of all the deep neck infections that we see in children and adolescents. Symptoms typically include a unilateral sore throat and neck swelling with a fluctuant tonsil with deviation of the uvula to the contralateral side. Other signs include that hot potato voice, uh, fever, drooling, as well as possible trismus, which of course is lockjaw. That occurs due to irritation of the internal uh, pterygoid muscle, which causes spasming and then clenching of the jaw. Patients will also often report a recent infectious pharyngitis. Cervical and submandibular lymphadenopathy might also be present, especially in younger children. Due to the preference of avoiding radiation exposure in children, a CT scan is usually not performed, even though it's better imaging modality for distinguishing between peritonsillar abscess and peritonsillar cellulitis. An intraoral or submandibular ultrasound is going to be used instead. And we'll see features of peritonsillar cellulitis that include homogeneous soft tissue swelling and abscesses with an echo-free cavity within a regular border. Labs are not needed when we suspect peritonsillar abscess or cellulitis. However, abnormalities could include elevated white blood cell counts, as well as possible signs of dehydration such as elevated BUN, uh, especially if the pain that the patient's experiencing is limiting oral fluid intakes. Now, the treatment for peritonsillar cellulitis as always with respiratory diseases, is going to first involve assessing for respiratory compromise and securing the airway. For treatment of peritonsillar cellulitis, IV antibiotics like ampicillin, sulbactam, or clindamycin will be used in cases of mild disease, and vancomycin is added for cases of moderate to severe disease, in addition, of course, to supportive care. Now, if the patient has no evidence of airway compromise, has no evidence of sepsis, trismus, or other severe signs, a trial of parenteral rather than IV antibiotics can be attempted. Now, the management of peritonsillar abscess is similar, but this time, drainage of the abscess, either with needle aspiration or incision and drainage, should be performed, and those same antibiotics that we use for the treatment of peritonsillar cellulitis should be given IV for these patients. Tonsillectomy is reserved for severe upper airway obstruction or failure of an abscess to resolve with drainage, or if the patient keeps developing peritonsillar abscesses. Next up, we have the retropharyngeal abscess. In children, the retropharyngeal abscesses occur most often between the ages of two and four years, and the abscess is usually polymicrobial, just as with the peritonsillar abscess. Those same organisms are typically going to include group A strep, staph aureus, and respiratory anaerobes. Patients will typically present with a stiff neck and neck pain with extension, as well as dysphagia, odynophagia, drooling, trismus, and fever. On exam, you might note midline swelling of the posterior pharyngeal wall. Now, if airway obstruction is present, they'll usually be leaning forward with their head in a sniffing position with, with uh, the ability to visualize suprasternal retractions, strider, tachypnea, and an anxious demeanor. This is indicative of respiratory distress. Now, in this position, of course, they're trying to maximize the patency of their airway. Now, there's a lot of overlap with the symptoms here and with epiglottitis, but epiglottitis usually progresses more rapidly. Labs should also be obtained in this position if the patient is not in danger of any respiratory compromise. Otherwise, of course, they should be obtained only after intubation and sedation is done. The white blood cell count here will be elevated and blood cultures may come back positive. As far as imaging goes, a lateral neck radiograph will often be obtained. The findings here are typically nonspecific and can show widening of the retropharyngeal space. However, a CT of the neck with contrast is your best modality because it can identify the actual abscess. The abscess will appear as a mass with rim enhancement and scalloping pressing on the posterior pharyngeal wall. The CT can also detect whether the abscess extends to other areas of the neck and involves blood vessels or other critical tissues and can even help us identify if only cellulitis is present without the actual retropharyngeal abscess. So the diagnosis of this abscess is made definitively with a contrast CT of the neck or when purulent material is obtained during surgical drainage. A presumptive diagnosis can be made based on clinical symptoms and lateral neck radiography. Treatment here is first securing the airway, especially if there is the potential for respiratory compromise. Then, if the abscess is identified as being mature, meaning there is complete rim enhancement and scalloping seen on CT, and the size is over 2.5 centimeters squared, then the patient should undergo surgical drainage. If the abscess does not meet that criteria, then we will try a trial of antibiotics alone. We can use ampicillin, sulbactam, or clindamycin for mild cases. And for moderate to severe cases, we can use vancomycin in addition to those.
Vancomycin will also be added if there's no response in 24 to 48 hours to ampicillin and sulbactam or clindamycin alone. Now, if patients still fail to respond to antibiotics alone, they may require surgical drainage, even if the abscess is small or not mature. Now, in all cases of surgical drainage, culture should be sent from the drained abscess because we want to narrow down the selected antibiotics. Next up is bronchiolitis. Now, this condition is caused by a viral infection, usually respiratory syncytial virus or rhinovirus. This results in an infection and inflammation of the bronchioles in children under two years of age, leading to wheezing and or rails. Now, the majority of infections causing bronchiolitis will occur during the fall and winter months. Now, this viral infection causes edema, secretions, and sloughed epithelial cells that obstruct the bronchioles that leads to these lower respiratory tract symptoms. Patients will often initially have signs of an upper respiratory infection, so things like rhinorrhea and nasal congestion, before these symptoms of a lower respiratory tract infection occur. Now, when respiratory syncytial virus is your causative pathogen, it's usually isolated alone using molecular diagnostics, whereas when rhinovirus is identified, there's usually simultaneous infection with another virus leading to bronchiolitis. Risk factors for developing bronchiolitis include prematurity, low birth weight, as well as the presence of comorbid chronic diseases, especially those that involve the lungs, like bronchopulmonary dysplasia or airway defects, immunodeficiencies, uh, neurologic diseases, and congenital heart disease that causes cyanosis can also put the patient at an elevated risk for severe disease. Environmental factors placing patients at an increased risk will include secondary hand smoke, as well as daycare attendance. Now, in terms of the symptoms here, as mentioned before, initially the patient will have things like rhinorrhea or other symptoms of an upper respiratory infection. Then after a couple of days, symptoms progress to involve the lower respiratory tract. And those symptoms will be things like cough, tachypnea, wheezing, rails, nasal flaring, and retractions. Patients may also become dehydrated because they have increased fluid requirements as a result of their tachypnea and their fever. And this tachypnea may also limit oral intake of fluids, which further worsens the problem. Respiratory failure can be seen in serious cases and is more frequent in patients presenting with apnea, as well as those who have the risk factors for bronchiolitis. Now, even in mild cases, the cough can last a very long time, several weeks in some instances. Now, imaging is typically not obtained unless other diagnoses are being considered, but chest radiographs may show peribronchial thickening, as well as possible hyperinflation and patchy atelectasis caused by mucus plugging. Now, some institutions will perform molecular analysis uh, in this scenario to identify the specific viral cause, but it's not necessary to do that to make a diagnosis. It's simply typically used to avoid unnecessary antibiotic use. Now, the diagnosis is made clinically without labs or imaging when a patient under two years old presents with upper respiratory symptoms that then progress to include things like lower respiratory tract symptoms. So, you know, tachypnea, retractions, wheezing, crackles, etc. Treatment here includes supportive care in the outpatient setting if the case is mild. In moderate to severe cases, we want to admit the patient for monitoring. We want to be able to uh, give them fluids via IV if needed, as well as supplemental oxygen via nasal cannula, face mask, or head box. And the target SpO2 levels are, the goal is uh, above 90 to 92%. Nasal suctioning should also be performed to relieve any obstructions that might be present. Now, signs that a patient may need more respiratory support, including the use of a CPAP or high-flow nasal cannula, or in severe cases, intubation, will include things like apnea, elevated PCO2 on ABG, that indicates, of course, a declining respiratory function, or hypoxemia, despite being given supplemental oxygen. Next up, we've got bordetella pertussis, also known as whooping cough. Now, this infection is covered by the DTaP vaccine, but those children who have not completed or have not received this vaccine or young adults with waning immunity can be affected. Now, there's three stages of pertussis, the cateral stage, paroxysmal stage, and the convalescent stage. The cateral stage is characterized by mild cough and coryza and lasts one to two weeks. Then comes the paroxysmal stage, which is characterized by paroxysms of severe coughing that is worse at night. And it's characterized by a long stretch of coughs with little inspiration occurring between those cough periods that can result in possible dyspnea, cyanosis, and gagging. The coughing fit is followed by that classic whooping sound, as well possibly by post vomiting. And the paroxysmal stage lasts between two and eight weeks. The last stage is the convalescent stage. This is characterized by gradual improvement of the cough over weeks to months. Now, the average total duration of cough in this condition is 112 days. Now, if a patient happens to get another respiratory tract infection during the convalescent stage, they may experience the return of a severe cough. 
Now, lab abnormalities seen in this include a leukocytosis with lymphocytosis, and typically with this disease, severe elevations in leukocytosis above 60,000 white blood cells per microliter are associated with increased disease severity. Tests that can provide a definitive diagnosis of pertussis include a positive bacterial culture or a positive PCR. Chest radiographs will typically appear normal in this condition, therefore um, typically aren't warranted. Now, some of the complications that you want to keep an eye out for include weight loss, for, weight loss from post vomiting, as well as difficulty feeding infants who have a frequent cough. Apnea is also seen, especially in infants under six months of age who have not been able to complete their vaccination series. And finally, death occurs in about 1% of infants under six months of age. Pertussis should be treated with a macrolide, usually azithromycin, and azithromycin is also given as prophylaxis to any close contact of the patient. Any patient who experiences feeding difficulties, apnea, seizures, pneumonia, respiratory distress, as well as any patient under the age of four months, regardless of the patient's symptoms, are going to require hospitalization. Patients under four months can deteriorate very fast and so should be closely monitored. Now, aside from antibiotics, patients are given supportive care with close fluid and nutritional management, as well as respiratory support. Triggers for coughing, such as suctioning if in the hospital, or cold air or exercise if outside the hospital, should be avoided. All right, the final topic we are going to discuss here is foreign body aspiration. This is a very important cause of morbidity and mortality in children. Now, depending on the degree of obstruction, the location of the obstruction, and the time from when the foreign body was aspirated, various symptoms can be, pre- can be present. Now, a history of choking is not always identified if the aspiration occurs out of sight of the caretaker or is forgotten or minimized by the caretaker if the symptoms initially resolve quickly. Partial obstruction of the airway would present with things like cough, strider, dyspnea, wheezing, tachypnea, and on exam, decreased breath sounds may be appreciated beyond the obstruction. Now, complete obstruction of the trachea would present with respiratory distress, altered mental status, cyanosis, and inability to speak or cough and if not rapidly cleared, can result in death, of course, due to asphyxiation. While adults typically aspirate foreign bodies in the right main stem bronchus, children more frequently have obstruction in either the right or the left main stem. Uh, And and that is because the bronchial tree is not yet done developing. And this anatomical tendency for the right main stem to be the most direct path to foreign body aspirates has not yet occurred in children. Now, if the aspiration event isn't witnessed, or if it is witnessed but symptoms are temporary and care isn't, isn't sought, then complications can develop. The most common complication you want to be on the lookout for is obstructive pneumonia. This usually presents as a typical community-acquired pneumonia, which initially improves with antibiotic treatment, but then reoccurs. Now, if being monitored with chest radiography, the infiltrate usually doesn't resolve, even with temporary resolution of symptoms. Other, Other complications you want to be on the lookout for include the formation of a lung abscess, as well as hemoptysis. Now, if your patient's stable, the first component of the workup should be a chest radiograph. Now, while the chest radiograph is normal in around a third of cases, even when a foreign body aspirate is present, it can also show signs indicating the presence of this obstructing foreign body, including mediastinal shift away from the side containing the foreign body, lucency distal to the obstruction, which represents a hyperinflated lung from air that becomes trapped behind the object, or possible infiltrates distal to the obstruction if that complication of post-obstructive pneumonia has developed. Around 10% of the time, the foreign body is radio-opaque, making for easy identification. After chest imaging, patients with identified or presumptive foreign body aspiration will undergo rigid bronchoscopy to both visualize and remove the foreign body. All right, some content review questions to end this one. Here's your first one, 20 seconds on the clock. Once you got it, come on back. Correct answer here is C. Next question, 20 seconds on the clock. If you need more time, hit that pause button. Correct answer here is C. Last question, 20 seconds on the clock. Once you got it, come on back. 
correct answer here is B. All right, guys, that is the end of this one. I will see you on the next lecture. Thank you.